Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I, uh, like uh, a lot of the other folks in the panel here, credit Dr. Ponsky for teaching me how to do a lot of this stuff. So this is probably really how he does it, but it's also how I do it. Uh, I have some disclosures which are not uh, relevant to what we're talking about today. So as you've heard already, in most settings, PEG is, is the preferred method for feeding access. It is clearly fast. It is clearly safe if, if uh, well thought out. And in most circumstances, it's well tolerated. But we know that there are some populations that have a specific benefit from getting post-pyloric feeding. There are additional populations in, in whom gastric feeding is, is clearly contraindicated. And in those circumstances, an alternate pathway is necessary. Um, such things to think about would be a gastric outlet obstruction, someone with post-vagotomy uh, and gastric emptying issues or like gastroparesis, uh, patients with chronic or active pancreatitis clearly benefit from post-pyloric feeding, and, uh, interest and also post-bariatric patients uh, of some sort. Think about a sleeve gastrectomy patient for whom there is really no body of the stomach within which to place a gastrostomy tube. Uh, in, in those circumstances, uh, whether before or after PEG was created, the, the initial operation here was really open jejunal feeding access. And obviously that comes along with the whole a myriad of surgical uh, issues. Uh, laparoscopy can mitigate some of those but doesn't alleviate all of the problems associated with it. With the, in, with the introduction of PEG, obviously, a jejunal feeding extension was the first method thought about to get post-pyloric feeding. The PEG gives you easy access to the stomach, and the jejunal extension lets you get a tube downstream. Dr. Marx is going to talk about that next, but as Dr. Ponsky alluded to, there are several problems with that. Number one is the tubes don't like to stay there. There are some tricks that you can do to help keep them there, but they do tend to back migrate uh, at a pretty good rate, which requires an end endoscopy and a replacement. The second thing is that you uh, have a relatively small uh, caliber lumen that will go through. It's usually 10 to 12 French, and therefore they tend to get clogged uh, at, at a great rate. So percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy tubes was sort of developed out of the need for a larger caliber tube that goes directly into the jejunum to alleviate some of the problems that I've just outlined. This was first described by Shike in, in 1987. This was essentially a, a modified pull technique utilizing the same sort of standard steps and standard kits. They described nine patients who had had partial or total gastrectomies in whom there was no body of the stomach easily accessible uh, below the costal margin. So what are the advantages of a PEG? Well, of a PEG, they're the, technically the same steps as a, as a PEG. If you understand the steps of doing a PEG, you understand the majority of the steps for a PEG. It allows a larger caliber tube to be placed into the jejunum directly as opposed to a jejunal feeding extension placed through a PEG tube where the lumen is obviously smaller and there's really a very low risk of back migration. Um, this advantages, this is technically more difficult than doing a PEG and, and there is a lower primary technical success rate Getting a clear window of transillumination and finding a safe track is not always easy, and oftentimes uh, you, you need to recognize that you don't have a safe track and you need to abort. Um, obviously, the complications here are a bit more dire. You know, with a PEG tube, as Dr. Ponsky showed earlier, the colon can be in the way. If you do a safe track technique, you know you're safe. The liver can often be in the way with a PEG, but once you start going beyond the ligament of trites, you have to realize that the colon, the small bowel, um, are, are easily in play here and are potential problems. Uh, the omentum and the mesenteric vessels are also potentially injured here, which is uh, more uncommon with a straight-up gastrostomy tube. So who do I pick for these? Obviously, gastroparesis, nutritional compromise, prior bariatric operations. We have a, a, a large and enlarging U.S. population getting bariatric operations who require uh, feeding access for nutritional intake and or anastomotic complications. Subtotal gastrectomy patients where you can't do a PEG because none of the stomach is below the costal margin. Uh, patients with esophageal or gastric malignancies uh, who need nutritional support for palliation. People who are deemed to be a high risk for aspiration with gastric feeding, such as those who have documented hiatal hernias or GERD, chronic pancreatitis patients, patients who need specific medications within which the delivery into the jejunum is beneficial, such as L-DOPA for Parkinson's disease. The contraindications are, for the most part, identical to a PEG, ascites, uncorrectable coagulopathy. Obviously, you need to have a better understanding of their anatomy. People who have had major abdominal procedures in whom you can expect adhesions to the small bowel, um, be wary of those patients. If there's a relatively short need or impaired healing capabilities, again, uh, think about uh, temporary feeding access in those patients. I'm going to show you two schematics here of what this looks like. The first on the left-hand side is a patient with normal anatomy. The scope is advanced beyond the ligament of trites, and a location is identified within which to put a peg tube. 
The second on the right-hand side is a patient who's had a Roux and Y gastric bypass. This is a very simple way of getting feeding access uh, b below the level of the GJ anastomosis into the proximal alimentary limb. I'm going to leave that picture up there for a minute and just, just remind everybody that as surgeons, you need to understand the patient's anatomy. You need to know in a, in a patient who's had a gastrectomy, which is the efferent, which is the afferent limb. You don't want to feed the efferent limb. You want to feed the afferent limb of a, a loop GJ anastomosis. In a gastric bypass patient, it's helpful to know whether it's an anticolic, antigastric, or retrocolic, retrogastric anastomosis to know where your safe location to place the gastrostomy is. To do this, it can be done with a simple forward viewing gastroscope, and I think the majority of people, if the stomach is enlarged and you need additional length, a pediatric colonoscope can allow you to push beyond the ligament of trites without much difficulty. Uh, rarely, I think, double balloon enteroscopy is necessary to do this. I have personally not, not done that. Uh, the scope is advanced to the, in the first proximal jejunal loop in which you have clear transillumination and a safe track through the safe track method is, is a must in this circumstance. The one thing I will caution is that that area of clear transillumination needs to be relatively focal. If you have a large dispersed area, uh, it's probably not the best spot to, uh, to attack that. Uh, fluoroscopy is optional, but is oftentimes very helpful to confirm your location, and I do rely on that in about 50% of the cases or so that I do. Uh, there are smaller peg kits available which have uh, smaller diameters. Uh, oftentimes I just use a standard 20 French gastrostomy tube kit, uh, which is my standard uh, peg kit as well. Uh, can we play this video? He's got it. There we go. So this is a patient who's had a Roux and Y gastric bypass. Uh, we start by identifying our, our normal anatomy. In this patient, I know because my colleagues did the case, it's an anti-colic, anti-gastric bypass. So I understand that the most anterior thing above the colon is going to be uh, the jejunum. So I know that I'm going to be above the colon. Obviously, in patients who have a very long blind end of that alimentary limb, just like an efferent or afferent uh, loop GJ anastomosis, you need to know you're going down the alimentary limb proper. So we'll head downstream, and uh, it, we're looking for an area of clear transillumination. We're going to do, there, there's some finger palpation, clear transillumination on the abdominal wall that I'm not showing, and our safe track technique through the abdominal wall. In this particular circumstance, because this patient was a high risk for peg dislodgement, we're going to use gastrointestinal T anchors, and I like to have the residents keep their finder needle in place and simply go parallel before they deploy that gastrointestinal T anchor. Uh, Dr. Mellinger showed using three in a triangle configuration around the gastrostomy tube. Uh, I do the same for a gastrostomy for a peg tube. I, I usually do one proximal in the elementary limb. I, I'll repeat that safe track technique just distal, and then I'll put a second T anchor distal. So rather than being a, a triangle, this is a straight line configuration down the elementary limb. These are not mandatory for a standard jejunostomy tube, but again, this was a high risk patient, and I thought it would be uh, advantageous to show that. The remainder of the technique here is, should look very similar to the PEG technique you've already seen described. In between those two T anchors, we're going to pass our guide sheath and needle. We'll grasp that with an endoscopic snare. The uh, looped guide wire will pass down uh, through that, and we'll grasp it with a snare and withdraw it through the mouth. Um, a couple words of caution. Uh, just like Dr. Ponsky said earlier, in people who have uh, a Schatzky's ring, for example, you, you may think that the tube is in the correct location. Uh, I do, as a mandatory part of the evaluation, follow the tube down because the majority of the time you will feel some additional resistance if you're passing through, for example, a gastrodejunal anastomosis. You will feel like you've got resistance and the bumper is in the right position. And oftentimes I ask the resident to actually pull the tube down blindly and I want them to tell me where they think it should be and they tell me I'm going to stop here. And we put the tube back down to show them that they're actually stuck at the anastomosis and they're not actually feeding in the correct position. Uh, we've retrie re uh, retrieved the wire. We're again going to go back down. That's the wrong direction, I say to the resident. Go the other way. So we're going to follow down the elementary limb here, and we're going to look for good tube position. As was emphasized earlier, tension here is not your friend. This needs to be very loose and tension-free against the uh, anterior gastric wall. I'm sorry, uh, anterior abdominal wall and against the, uh, uh, the lumen. You can see that this uh, silicone retention dome is not obstructing. In some patients in whom I can't get very far downstream or after the procedure, if they demonstrate that they are refluxing into their gastric pouch in any fashion, if you feel it's necessary, you can always add a jejunal feeding extension downstream. Uh, the other issue that I caution people is if you use a gastrostomy tube for this, um, 
make sure that your nursing staff or the family who's going to be using this tube understand that this is not a G-tube. It looks like a G-tube. It may be in the same position as a G-tube, but if you bolus feed these patients, they will be miserable. So make sure that people understand that the name of the tube does not tell you where the tube is located uh, on the outside. Uh, when I remove a PEDGE, uh, I use a standard, you can use a standard pull method. Uh, I oftentimes like to use a cut and push method. I, I go in endoscopically, I get a snare around the uh, silicone retention dome, I cut the tube and I retrieve it uh, per os. And I do that so that I'm not dilating the tract with that retention dome. Um, because people uh, may often have biliopancreatic secretions going past this, the volume going past that retrieval site can be a little bit higher. And uh, if I have a good angle, I'll oftentimes place an, an Ovesco clip over top to simply reduce the amount of uh, effluent they have and reduce the risk of a long-term uh, jejunal fistula developing. Thank you very much.